Okay. I think let's start. People will join us, keep joining us. Um, but this is different time zones for different people. So I don't want to wait too long. We've got quite a crowd. Um, people joining us from all around. So let's let's get going. Hello, everybody. If I can get to my script, then things get a lot easier. I want to welcome you all to this webinar on governing Earth systems tipping points in times of multiple crises. This is the 14th in the tipping point discussion series. It is great to see so many people still logging on to follow our discussion series. For those who are joining us for the first time today, this discussion series has four goals. Firstly, to advance knowledge on tipping elements. Secondly, to support efforts to increase consistency on how tipping elements are treated in the scientific community. Thirdly, to develop a research agenda. And finally, to design joint experiments and ideas for a tipping element model intercomparison project, which is known as TIPMIP. There are several networks behind the series. They are the Earth Commission, which is a global team of scientists with a mission to define a safe and just corridor for people and the planet. The second is the Analysis, Inte uh, analysis Integration and Modeling of the Earth System Project, or AIMS as they are known, which is a global research network composed of Earth system scientists and scholars that seek to develop interdisciplinary ways to understand the complexity of the natural world and its interactions with human activities. Both AIMS and the Earth Commission are hosted by Future Earth, a global network of scientists, researchers, and innovators collaborating for a more sustainable planet. And finally, the Safe Landing Climate Lighthouse activity of the World Climate Research Program, which explores routes to safe landing spaces for human and natural systems. This event is co-organized by the International Institute for Applied Systems Analysis and the Potsdam Institute for Climate Impact Research and the Global Systems Institute at the University of Exeter quite a mouthful, all the people involved in this. A few words on how the webinar will work. Both our speakers will make their presentations first, and this is followed by a Q&A session. As they are speaking, I would invite you to post your questions using the Q&A feature at the bottom of the Zoom window. Follow the questions there and vote for by liking the questions that you are most interested in hearing the replies to. Please indicate also who you are addressing your question to. Some of the questions might be responded to directly by the speakers in the Q&A, if they are straightforward, simple questions. Following the event today, we will post a recording of this webinar on the Tipping Point Series Confetti webpage, so it can be accessible to anyone. My name is Sulve Crompton. I am looking at science policy interface as manifested in a particular type of summary within the UN system called a summary for policymakers for my research. These summaries are a particular characteristic of multilateral organs which fall within the ambit of the international environmental governance, like the Global Environment Outlook produced by UNEP or reports by the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. I come from the government sector. I've worked both in South African and Norwegian governments, but governance is of course much broader than only government, which brings us to today's topic. Governing Earth Systems Tipping Points in Times of Multiple Crisis. This is the perfect follow-up to the session we had in January, which was on how to tip society and not the planet. Considering tip tipping points in a context of governance is a logical next step to putting this knowledge we've been accumulating throughout the series into practice. What can we do on the one hand to avoid negative tipping points, but on the other to stimulate positive tipping points? Our first speaker is Dirk Messner who is currently president of the German Environment Agency. And he will be followed by Manjana Milkerite, I hope I pronounced that correctly, who is a postdoctoral fellow from the University of Oslo. Both of them actually have extensive backgrounds and experiences, which will definitely make this interesting. To our first speaker, prior to his role at the German Environment Agency, 
Professor Dirk Mesner has been director at the Institute for Environment and Human Security at the United Nations University in Bonn, co-chair of the German Advisory Council on Global Change. He's also worked with the um, German Development Agency, and he will be speaking on multiple crises in global sustainability governance. You have the mic, sir. Okay, thank you very much, Solvi. I prepared some slides. I think Caroline will share those with you. So as you can see, I, I uh, changed the title a little bit. I will talk about a stress test or stress tests in plural for sustainability transformation optimists. So I'm a sustainability transformation optimist actually, but I'm moving through stress tests. And so I think the stress tests are related to the tipping point question, which you, which you start to discuss. And I must apologize myself. You will see some slides where German words or even sentences are still in. I did not have the time to adjust everything, but I think the slides will be helpful to follow uh, regarding what I'm, what I'm going to say. So let's start then and let's go to the first uh, slide. I will have four slides for pre-remarks, which I would have mentioned before the 24th of February 2022, so before the Russian aggression started. And then the second start is about the new context, the Russian aggression, turbulences in the global economy, turbulences in the global international system. But before I do so, before I move into the current context, my pre-remarks regarding where I would say we stand. You, know? you see here on the first side, slide, this is common knowledge for all of you. The budget is shrinking, the peak is still not there. We need much more acceleration. This needs to be the 2020s. This decade needs to be the decision and implementation decade if you really want to, to achieve the goals and the boundaries which we accepted upon in the Paris Agreement and also in the SDGs. So time acceleration is the first point which I wanted to mention here. If you go to the next slide, I would like to describe the situation. And uh, please remember I'm in the period before the Russian aggression started. I would describe our situation as a situation of huge amb ambiguities. Maybe this is about tipping points here, so, uh, so because we are in a situation in which we could still achieve our goals, but we could, uh, we could also fa uh, fail very easily. And the, the, the elements here to describe the situation are the following. On the left-hand side, you see the international energy markets. Renewable energies are becoming much more important from year to year. The energy system globally is shifting. It's shifting radically and prices are going down for renewable energy production. So this is all very good. And on the right-hand side of this energy diagram, I do have some issues which for me are symbolizing that we are moving into the right direction actually. I'm mentioning here the European Green Deal, which is ambitious. I'm mentioning Fridays for Future, which, which is a global social force. I'm mentioning the Biden administration going towards climate neutrality now also. I'm mentioning the German uh, organization of the private sector, which is preparing strategies for implementing our climate neutrality goals in Germany. I'm mentioning Glasgow, where the global community emphasized that climate neutrality is now the new North Star for the global economy. So many elements moving into the right direction. But on the right hand side, on the top, you also see, this is from the GAP report, which you all know, the GAP report 22, which has been presented in Sharm El Sheikh. You all know that we are still on a 2.6 to 3 degrees global warming, warming pathway. So we have, I mean, we are shifting into the right direction, but we are still not at all on track. And on the right hand, on the, on the, top, on the, on the bottom, I'm calling this the factor six world. This is also from the GAP report. You can see that we need to be six times faster in many dimensions of the decarbonization world, six times faster. This is obviously huge in terms of acceleration and investment patterns and regulatory changes and shifts and so forth. So ambiguity, you know? we are in a tipping point situation when it comes to global climate politics. When you go to the next slide, I have good news from the, from the German sector, from, from the German private sector. And I'm mentioning this because during a long period of time, we had the feeling that we have to fight against the past dependencies of our industries. But this is now step-by-step step changing. And my example is the German context. On the left-hand side, Klimapfade 2.0. This is the study of the German industry organization, uh, how to implement the 
climate neutrality goal in Germany towards 2045. And the interesting thing is the trajectory, the pathway which the German industry organization is describing is very similar to the trajectory and pathway which we as German Environment Agency describe. This is astonishing and important. No? And on the right hand side, you see a book there, Deutschland's Neue Agenda, Germany's New Agenda. I published this book with several colleagues together and we asked 60 important CEOs from the German uh, private sector to describe how they solve the climate issue within their companies and within their sector towards 2045. So becoming climate neutral in 2045. And only those could write in the book agreeing about the targets which we, which we have been defining on the political side. And most of our important large companies agreed on participating. So the private sector shifting into this direction and this is an important information. This might be a tipping point, Solvay, that the private sector sees its future in climate neutral business concepts. On the next slide, um, there is a lot of German language in here, but the important message here is that our agency, the German Envir Environment Agency, we published a year and a half ago for the German government before we had elections. So it is actually a program for the, for the new government in Germany, which started at the beginning of 2002. We uh, presented this um, study on 70% of reductions of greenhouse gases by 2030 compared to 1990. And my main message is here that this is possible. We demonstrate that this is possible. But we also show that there is, I, know, I call this, there is little, very little room for selectivity. We in Germany and in Europe, across Europe, we have debates about let's move forward in this sector a bit more rapid and we can be slower in the other one. Our report here is showing that in the German context, we need to do more or less everything we know that we can do it and which, which is economically feasible. We need to do all of this across all sectors. If we don't do so comprehensively, we will not achieve climate neutrality in Germany in 2045. So it is necessary, the pathway, it is possible, but it is hard work no? and uh, deep change in brief periods of times are needed. So this is how I would, I would have described the situation before one, one yeah, this is yeah. the right, no, the other one, the yeah. next one, Caroline. Yes, this one. So I'm now moving into the, the current context. You know? And what I would like to talk about is that I see currently three dynamics, which for me imply this stress test for a sustainability transformation optimist that's, that's myself. You know? And I will talk about these three dynamics. The first one is about the transformation and multiple crises. I will focus on the Russian war. I will then go into um, challenges, governance challenges, which we are confronted with zooming into a national context, the German context, now because we are ambitious. Until now, we have been arguing that we need better goals, we need more ambition in our, in our uh, target systems. Now we have these target systems on the European level, on the German level. What is happening and what kind of challenges do we see because we are starting to be ambitious? I call this the second order problems. And then the third dynamics is about we could fail. No? And I have uh, four global headaches for you, where I think we need much more attention and much more emphasis to challenge these global headaches. This is what I'm going to talk about for the next um, 15, 10 to 15 minutes or so. And I will start with the multiple crisis issue on the next slide. And I have, I have four considerations for you. And as I said, I will only focus on the the Russian aggression issue. There are more multiple crises, obviously, but the Russian aggression is in the center here. And um, the starting point is that I attended a conference in March 2022, last year, after the start of the war in Ukraine. And we sat together with the European Commission and many sustainability researchers, and we talked about our sustainability uh, pathways from different groups and different perspectives. And I was completely astonished that during the first day, no one mentioned the new crisis we were in, the Russian aggression, because the Russian aggression is changing so many parameters of things which have to do with the sustainability transformation pathways we are working on, which, which we try to, 
to uh, implement. And what I did then during the conference is, you see this here on the slide, I put down a list of global interdependency crises, uh, which, uh, which I start with 2000 and I go towards 2022, 2023. The most important perspective and the most important message here for our discussion is that since 2000, Solvay, you know, in a rhythm of two to three years, we had one big international interdependence crisis, one big global crisis from a European perspective. You know, the list would be different from an African perspective, an Asian perspective, this is a European perspective, but we had one uh, big crisis, global crisis after the other. And all of those crises obviously do have impacts for our sustainability pathways. And my point is that we are not recognizing these external shocks to our sustainability pathways. We need to do so. If we don't do so, we don't understand that most of these shocks implied backlashes for sustainability transformations. No? And look here, I have the wars on terror, the financial crisis, the refugee crisis, authoritarian populism wings, uh, waves across Western countries, global warming impacts becoming visibly globally, the pandemic, now the war. All of this back backlashes to our, to our sustainability transformation pathways. We need to take this into consideration. This is my first argument with this slide. The second argument is that in the global debate, we are all, all always listening or often listening that we need to go back to the world order pre 24th of February, before the war started. What I'm showing, showing here with this list of global interdependency crises is the global world order did not work well before the war started. Beyond the security challenges we have, we do not have a global cooperation system, a global governance system, which is managing these global dynamics well, because what, how, what we can see here is that every two to three years, a big global crisis. So when we talk in Germany about the Zeitenwende, shift in perspective, this needs to go far beyond the debate about uh, military structures and security investments. We need to talk about our global governance and global cooperation system. Let's go to the next uh, slide then. Uh, I have some, some impacts of the Russian war directly on sustainability transformations. And I would like to, to move into two directions. The first one is that uh, without, uh, without being cynical, no? I see some drivers of change in a positive way, and I see those in the energy field, because energy security, renewable energies, the decarbonization pathways, this is now coming together, moving and shying away from cheap gas from Russia. This is accelerating midterm the energy transition. I'm posi positive and optimistic in this regard, and I'm also emphasizing that in this war, no, last December, December 2022, we achieved a second pillar of the European trading scheme uh, to manage greenhouse gas emissions. This is immense because there has been a lot of resistance against a new focus on emission trading in the fields of traffic, urban development and, and buildings, but we have this now. And uh, therefore I see a positive impact of the turbulences around the war in the energy sector. But I'm also seeing three mechanisms which are making climate politics and sustainability transformations much more difficult than beforehand. And these three mechanisms are the following. The first one is that there is a shift away from our discussions on sustainability, the Anthropocene decarbonization towards security, military issues, and the future of uh, the NATO, for example. No? So this is one thing, the public attention is shifting away. We need to emphasize much more what we would like and need to talk about. The second element is that in Germany, we are invested 100 billion euros into military infrastructures and our budgets for military investments are moving up. And in many countries, the same is happening. And meanwhile, our older uh, budgets, our investments into development cooperation are under huge stress. So money is, money is shifting away. And in sectors where we need public money to make progress in terms of sustainability transformations and climate neutrality, for example, when it comes to mobility systems, public transport, urban development, the business is much more difficult now than it has been before. And we are running out of money in many regards. And the third element is that uh, organizational capacities are limited always. You know, there are boundaries of the capabilities. And I can tell you that in many German cities and in many European cities, 
mayors who tried to push the climate neutrality transformation forward before the war started are now organizing refugee waves, for example. No? So organizational capacities are also shifting into different direct directions. These are my three main mechanisms where the war is making structurally our transformation pathways more difficult. On the next slide, so we talked about this uh, when we started to, to uh, interchange, uh, you wanted to hear something about the global, the global south. So here's my global, my global south uh, slide for you. Uh, my point is the following. Uh, in the West, we are listening a lot to, we are standing united and together con being confronted with the Russian aggression, aggression. But this is actually not the case. As you all know, in the United Nations, 50 nations are staying neutral most of them neutral, only a few are supporting Russia directly, but 50 nations neutral. And this is a situation in which we in the West are arguing that this is a, an attack of the global order itself. This is a threat against international security around the globe. No? But 50 countries, many of those being part of the G20 context, many of those being African nations, half of African countries are neutral in this situation. And many of them are authoritarian countries, but many of them are also democratic states. So it's not a democratic, non-democratic divide. From my perspective, it's a global south, global south um, Western countries divide. And what I'm observing is mistrust in many countries. And we did an analysis of how, how in public media, how in media countries are uh, justifying their neutrality in the, war context of Russia against Ukraine. And I'm listening to three main arguments again and again. So this is what I wanted to, to contribute to this discussion, Global South and the West, mistrust. No? The first thing is double standards and hypocrisy. I mean, I'm very often hearing that we are interested as Europeans in the Russian war. We are not interested in, the many, in so many conflicts around the globe, Yemen, Many people died in the Yemen war. We are not even, we are not even counting the death. No, we are not even knowing about the conflict, understanding the conflict. So people are arguing that Putin needs to be brought to international courts no? who have been asking for this in the context of the Iraq war and President Bush. No? So um, double standards and hypocrisy is uh, heading number one. Heading number two is that the Western world is not delivering when it comes to, comes to global justice. I mean, you, we all know about the 100 billion when it comes to the adaptation fund. It is not there after 10 years of hard discussions. No? But we are pushing and pressing countries to move into certain directions, climate protection, for example, going out of coal rapidly, going out of fossil fuels, but we are not delivering. No? And during the pandemic, rich people first, the classical pattern. No? So there is a lot of mistrust in developing countries in the global south. And the last thing, Eurocentrism. No? I mean, we, we, I heard the most concise and loudest criticisms that Europe is only having its own focus in mind, not understanding the problems of the others in a field where we are very proud to make progress. And I'm also very proud. It's the European Green Deal, the European Green Deal. No? We developed the European Green Deal without consulting it beforehand or in the process of developing it with African countries. And what we are saying in the European Green Deal is that now we are going for circularity, so we are not any longer interested in your resources. No? And now we are going for decarbonization quickly, so we are not any longer interested in your fossil fuels. This has, the European Green Deal has impacts on trade flows and economic opportunities in African countries. I think it is worthwhile to move into this direction, what we needed to talk about all the structural adjustment mechanisms related to it with African partners. And we did not, we did not. No? And the silence was loud in Africa. Uh, European partners waited for applause actually from Africa, but it was silence. No? So these are mistrust elements and mechanisms. And let's go to the next slide. So what you can see here is that it's a concept. It's a concept about collective intentionality. It is coming from philosophy and evolutionary linguistics and evolutionary biology. And it tries to understand how cultures of cooperation in complex systems emerge. And 
the, the point here is that to go to move to a next level of cooperation now Solvay, Manana, it needs to be global. No? We need global solutions for climate issues, for biodiversity issues, the earth system. No? This is a completely new challenge on the next level of cooperation. And to, and to create rules, institutions, and enforcement mechanisms, this is what the collective intentionality concept is telling us. You need pre-investments to get these kind of institutions going and to become them stable. No? You see joint knowledge creation here, you see joint practices and routines here, you see joint narratives and perspectives here, you see joint norms and values and interests here, you see a joint past and a joint future emerging as narratives. No? So if you take this uh, terminologies, my argument would be the following. We have been successful, this um, workshop is part of that, in joint knowledge creation. No? So we have good, global arguments from a global research community for sustainability transformations, for climate protection. We have been doing good work in this regard. The next element here, we have joint practices and routines which, which drive cooperation and establishes cooperation. But we all know that what we are doing here is far away from what we needed to really get the transformations around the globe done. So we are not on track in this field. The third element is then for getting a new level of cooperation done and driving it requires joint narratives and perspectives. In this element here, regarding this element, I'm optimistic. I think we have been defining the concepts for the future with the SDGs, with the narrative of the Anthropocene, with the narrative of climate neutrality. We have done well here, but the practices are still not aligned to our new narratives. We are far away from our with our activities, comparing those with the narratives which we, have, which we have been bringing into the global arenas. And the fourth element here, joint norms and values. I mean, I talked about the three dynamics of mistrust. We do not have already joint norms and values, and therefore our interests are completely different in many regards. So our joint practices and our interests and norms are still not aligned with our new narratives, which we have been pushing forward during the last 20, 30 years or so. So I will um, go to the next slide to, I think, finish my reflections around the global multiple crisis. And what I wanted to emphasize with this last slide on the global multiple crisis is the following. I mean, what came to my mind observing the last two years is that our democracies in the Western world, our countries here in the European Union, we have been organizing transformative politics and very ambitious change being confronted with the pandemic and being confronted with the war. Now, regarding the war, I already told you in Germany, 100 billion euros two days after the war started for military infrastructures, 200 billion for the social impacts of the energy crisis. So we did and organized bold action. This is what we are not seeing for 20, 30 years in the climate field, in the sustainability field. There we see incremental change. And this implies that the climate crisis and the earth system crisis is not being perceived by our decision makers, but probably also not by our populations. These are not perceived as existential crises. We argue that they are, you know, but they are not perceived as such in difference or in contrast to the pandemic and the Russian war. Mm -hmm. So let's move into the national uh, context. And this is the next slide then. So wait, five minutes, is this okay with you? Yeah, okay. So um, I'm now in the, in, the, in the national context. This is unfortunately mainly in German, but I will drive you through these, these fields here. And I will only mention this is a hexagon. No? I have six dimensions of the politics of transformations now in the German context, in the European context, in a situation in which we try to be as ambitious as possible. And I will mention two, three elements which for me are very important. The first one is institutional transformation. This is element number three and on the right hand side there, institutional transformation. The challenge which I wanted to emphasize because this is about governance is the following. We are confronted in all sectors in our economy with, I call them hybrid institutional settings. No? 
look into the building sector, the transportation and mobility sector, we have traditional growth, pro growth policies and incentives and standards. We have some green elements around those. This is hybrid, no? old growth strategies and some green around it. And now the auto automatism is that we build a next generation of standards and regulations around these already hybrid structures and this might translate into a high level of bureaucracy and high level of regulation. Meanwhile, I would suggest that in all sectors, we need to transform these hybrid governance structures into completely to 100% sustainability oriented governance frameworks. So we talk a lot about technologies. We talk a lot about new investment patterns. We need institutional transform transformation pathways in any sector. And this is not happening. My second element, which I wanted to mention is about concertation in our society. So bringing actors together. What I'm seeing is that in many sectors, we need to do things in parallel in the sustainability transformation process, which we normally in our societies do one step after the other. I will mention the hydrogen transformation in our industries. No? So, Companies need to decide now whether they go for green hydrogen. They need to do this in a situation in which the regulatory framework for, the, for that is still not existent. No? And the infrastructure which we are going to build is also only be, being planned, but not existent. And the international partners to make this a package with which will work is already only in the making. So a lot of concertation between the state, public sector, civil society, and science is needed to organize these processes in a synergetic way because step by step, this will cost a lot of time and lead us far beyond our climate goals. And the last point which I wanted to emphasize here is that we have many, I call them difficult issues in our own debate, negative emissions, carbon capture, capture sequestration, carbon dioxide removal, geoengineering is becoming an issue. So having an eye on these challenging questions is something which we urgently need to talk about. So the last uh, three minutes, my four headaches, no? and I'm only giving you the, the headlines for that. I have four global headaches where we urgently, urgent, uh, where we uh, easily could fail. Therefore, I'm mentioning these issues. We need a high emphasis on that politically. No? Let's move to the next slide. My first headache is China huh? and maybe China and India. Now, I'm not blaming the two countries. What I'm only saying is that, as you can see here, China is going and moving towards 14 gigatons of emissions in 2030. And you can then say, uh, see that they are trying to move down their greenhouse gas emissions towards 2060 to zero, a huge process of acceleration of decarbonization. I don't know how this can work. But what I can say is that if you take the Chinese emissions and the Indian emissions together, 20 gigatons. This is what I said at the beginning, halving global emissions from decade to decade. This is actually the global budget available and compatible with two degrees or below two degrees. So the numbers are not coming together. We need urgent discussions about decarbonization and, and how to accelerate it with the large countries. And this is something, this is my first headache. No? The numbers are not coming together still. My second headache is about, on the next slide, about our century of cities. Global infrastructures will more or less double from today to 2050, 2060, double. No? And you all know that 40% of global emissions, only buildings, 70% 70, 70 of global emission, emissions being related to cities. This implies that from today on, for the next decades to come, doubling these global urban infrastructure, all of that need, needs to be streamlined and aligned with climate neutrality. If we don't do so, we are running out of any budget. And I'm not seeing this kind of rigorosity needed in the field of urbanization. Therefore, urbanization, global urbanization is my second headache. headache. My third headache is negative emissions. I was co-author of a, of a paper, maybe some of the authors are here in the room, where we looked at the 1.5 to 2 degrees scenarios and tried to understand how realistic they are and what we can learn from them. And one of the lessons has been 
what I called beforehand, no room for selectivity. There is no silver bullet. We need to do many things across any sector globally. No? So this is already something. But the second element was then that even in the most optimistic scenarios, we see in the scenario starting in 2030, 2040 going further, huge, uh, uh, huge negative emissions needed to stay below two degrees Celsius. If on the right hand side, you can see here negative emissions in the, in the volume are around uh, 10 gigatons. 10 gigatons is 25% of our current emissions. I mean, this is not a minor thing. These are not residual emissions. We need strategies for that and we do not have strategies for that. No? So negative emissions is my third headache and how to move forward with solid science-based strategies here. And my last sentence is, because I'm running out of time, uh, we are getting more loss in damage you know, from day to day, from year to year, at any continent. You know, we, we, we had damaging events, even in Germany, where we saw pictures which we would have thought beforehand that this is something from, from countries with weak in, in, infrastructural systems, but we had to have this damage, loss and damage events also in the European context, but we'd see it, of, of course, globally. In Pakistan last year, you all remember that. And the point which I wanted to make here is not only the damage dimension and how costly this is from a human perspective and from a financial perspective, but in addition to that, I'm listening more often and more often and more often, now coming from the global south, if we don't get this right, you know, bringing the emissions down, stabilizing the temperatures, geoengineering is becoming, becoming an option because uh, this might be a tool which countries which are suffering the most from loss and damage might ask for if decarbonization is not accelerating as fast as we needed it. And therefore this field of loss and damage and the interrelationships with geoengineering scenarios, which we should try to avoid is what uh, my last headache is about. Thank you very much for listening. Thank you very much, Dirk, for that. That was very rich. There is a, a, a lot there. Um, uh, but let's move on to Manana, Manana, sorry, so that we can get to the questions because there are already quite a few. Just a reminder, please write your questions in the Q&A because that gives others the opportunity to respond to, to approve, to build on your questions if they so want. But that way we get, a, 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 I can get a sense about what questions will be interesting to, to more people. So please write your questions in there. Uh, Manana is a postdoctoral researcher at the University of Oslo, and uh, but that belies actually quite a lot of experience uh, from Canada and the US. She has a PhD in global governance from the University of Waterloo in Canada um, and has spent time at several institutions there, including Purdue, Harvard, um, where she did her master's, etc. Her current research focuses on the role of imagining the future with a respect to sustainability transformations and so looks at social tipping points. Um, but uh, she will now be presenting on the governance of climate tipping points. Uh, so without further ado, Manana, please, you have the mic. All right, can you hear me? Also, can you see the slide properly? If somebody could indicate that this is... It's fine, yeah, it's good. It's All right, thank you. Of course, unconventional approaches because we're moving in a risk space that is very different. We have to consider here also the potential for cascades, uh, as you all might be familiar with. There's a huge potential that tipping points are connected to, to each other. Uh, tipping one might make tipping others more likely because they are connected to each other. So how does this cascading effect feature in our governance? Are we going to be focused on particular tipping points more because they hold higher potential to tip others? Uh, and how do we take this into account? So we, this needs to be considered at a very fundamental level. Also, we have to attend to novel kinds of scales and scale interactions when it comes to tipping points. We are used to thinking about climate governance uh, at multiple scales already, but primarily at a global scale right now in our global institutions, the Paris Agreement. But we might have to also think about a novel scale that is at the level of the tipping element itself. And there we do not have appropriate institutions, I believe. A last thing for kind of fundamental principles is, is this one. I think we have to really think hard about tipping element diversity. Currently, all the writing tends to, most of the writing tends to talk about tipping points as one set of challenges that 
comes in a new box that needs a new set of responses. But these tipping um, points or tipping elements are all very, very different. Each of them has a different geographic extent, a different threshold temperature, uh, a different time horizon for over which they unfold, different types of impacts, different, therefore different implications for governance. I really believe we need to start thinking about them both as a package uh, that might need some collective or overall responses, but also then in terms of each tipping point specifically, we need to have more specific ideas about what to do about each of them. Now, thinking about tipping points, uh, I think the temporality of tipping points presents us with the challenge of thinking over long time horizons, and it makes sense to distinguish three phases uh, when we're starting to talk about governance. You might be familiar with this with this visual that's trying to represent how tipping points work. The system at the moment sits here and is being pushed up uh, this out of the stability basin over the threshold that would be here, the tipping point, and might then move over a certain time horizon into a new stability basin where it has a different kind of character, right? So this is the stylized version of representing tipping points. But it's important to, to uh, put a timeline onto this. And very often, and also to make sure we understand what should happen in each of those phases in terms of governance. So in this, I would distinguish this first phase before we are even uh, reaching the tipping point uh, as a, the, the key for uh, phase for governance in which we find ourselves actually right now. And this phase before we reach tipping points can be years, decades. If we're lucky, it's more than decades or multiple decades. But for some tipping points, as we already heard, this might be about a decade we have left before the system hits the thresholds when we transition into the second phase where these changes, where the, the system starts self-accelerating by uh, positive feedback mechanisms and moves towards its new stable state. That second phase could also last between decades to millennia, I would say. This could be huge time windows of continuous change that puts continuous and con on always changing pressures on affected human societies and of course, um, ecological systems too. So we're talking about very, very long change processes until these systems reach a new normal and that is then uh, the third phase. And if you wanna give look at these three phases again, uh, in terms of the jobs for governance we see, this first phase uh, would be one where we have to develop key knowledge about these change processes. So we have a lot of science policy work to do, uh, do monitoring and early warning development. This is where governance actors form, uh, key coalitions form, actors start understanding what their political interests are, where they choose the governance venues, where this should be addressed. This is also where we have to think about potential impacts that happen in phase two so we can start planning for uh, or creating institutions that can tackle these these impacts and minimize them this is where goal setting occurs right? we fundamentally choose or decide collectively creating collective intentionality if i can use Dirk Messner's words what if anything should we do about these tipping points and this very importantly is of course the window for prevention if we choose that our key policy goal is to prevent one or all of these tipping points to the extent that's still possible. This is the window when we can do it. And we are very uncertain, at least to some extent, when that window for prevention closes for specific tipping points. And as I said, I think this phase could be years to decades. And for some tipping points, this is very little time left. Then that second phase, once we are beyond prevention, and of course, we're dealing with the experience of various impacts, and some of those impacts might surprise us because we might not have thought them all through or have good science for all of them, but many of them might reflect what we already know about climate change impacts, of course. That's when the work of adaptation is being done, we're all, when we're dealing with loss and damage, and when our governance institutions are hopefully doing their work of helping us deal with these impacts. I do not have a lot of thoughts about that third phase of what it means to um, start stabilizing systems in a new normal, uh, but we can probably think more about this once we understand these first two phases a little better. So I label these right now preliminarily as anticipation and prevention, phase one, impact management, phase two, and stabilization, phase three. And here I'm just trying to show, hopefully um, somewhat correctly drawing on the recent literature, what this might look like for a specific tipping point, and that's the tropical coral reefs. For some people, their opinion is that we might already have passed a tipping point, but in the most recent literature, we think 1.5 degrees is 
uh, where the threshold roughly lies for, for the tropical coral reefs. And that means in terms of a timeline, we had roughly two to four decades of knowledge building and development about this tipping point. So we have uh, scientific information and warnings about potential bleachings and reef death since the 1990s. We've seen mass bleachings more frequently since then, especially in the last decade. Uh, local changes with partial recovery, but once we are here, and it's not quite clear when exactly that is, but we think maybe in the 2030s, we will we will enter the phase of impact management, right, when this could can no longer be prevented. We're going to see more frequent bleaching and uh, death of reefs with their ecological and, of course, social effects on fisheries, on tourism, on livelihoods, on culture, migration, poverty, economic change, and so forth, until after a number of decades in this case, I think, there will be um, a time when the reefs are gone and we are stabilizing new social and ecological organization in places that will then be independent of coral reefs that will of course look very different. So let me move then to uh, something more concrete, actors, venues and approaches. And I'm gonna to try to speed up so we have a little time for discussion as well. So when it comes to tipping points, as I said, we might think primarily about the right actors and the right scales uh, and look towards the global level, right? These are earth system components. These are big, they're beyond individual countries. So of course we wanna think about global governance and there the UNFCCC might be your first target of a governance actor you might uh, look for or look at. Um, but the Paris Agreement itself doesn't really address the issue of tipping points themselves yet in very concrete ways. So that might be the first space to ask of uh, where we might make choices about climate um, tipping points. But there might also be other spaces that might be interested or relevant for addressing these particular issues. Other multilateral institutions, including financial institutions, the private sector might also be affected and therefore interested uh, and become a governance actor. Transnational NGOs and civil society as well. But as I said, we also have to think more specifically about the, scale, the tipping point specific scales that could be continental or regional. Uh, so governance initiatives that might correspond to specific tipping points like the Arctic Council for the Arctic and um, tipping points that might be uh, specific to that region. Or you could think about the Amazon, of course, as a very distinct region that might have its own organizational context. But we have also tipping points that do not have yet specific organizations as starting points for thinking about governance for these tipping points. So here I just uh, name a couple of them and we might have to consider whether novel actors and novel scales might be important. Of course, there's also a big role for national governments. I list here that national adaptation plans are relevant as governance tools that might have to be revised, but also national industrial policies. If I think about Australia and the Great, Great Barrier Reef, there's a lot to think about that's not just adaptation. And everything will happen at the local scale. So we cannot forget that this local scale actors will be relevant for these issues as well. Issues in phase one to think about, when we think about anticipation and prevention, this phase one that I pointed out, is learning, knowledge, co-production, and meaning making, right? We don't, and this is the phase where all actors engaged in governance and the future in governance of climate tipping points have to figure out their own political interests. What do these things actually mean for me? Am I concerned? Am I at risk? What should I do? Uh, and that involves risk assessments, and learning about tipping points, knowledge formation, and then uh, governance venue selection, agenda setting, that's of course where politics start, and policy goal selection. So are we actually trying to prevent tipping points versus accepting that some of these might pass and we'll just have to deal with the impacts? Are we gonna to try to prevent all of them or prioritize some? What if prevention is no longer an option for some of these tipping points? So we have to think about uh, these questions at this point in time. Many of you might jump like I did also to mitigation. So of course we have to, uh, speed up our efforts to uh, reduce greenhouse gases to a deal to deal with climate tipping points keeping global temperatures as low as possible is obviously uh, the strongest measure we can take to rein in and possibly prevent climate tipping points so yes we have to talk again about the global temperature goal have we made the right have we selected the right temperature range or do we have to reassess this uh, we have to talk about mitigation pathways. There might be, if we want to prevent climate tipping points, fewer pathways might be available to actually achieve that goal. And especially we have to talk about overshoot. Uh, we have seen at least some emerging work that talks about 
the risks of triggering tipping points within an overshoot phase. So the question of how high we go above our target temperatures and for how long, those questions now really matter. So this is the, a little graph from a recent paper by Wunderling et al. That's talking specifically about those overshoot scenarios and the risks of triggering tipping points within those overshoot phases. So here you see four potential tipping points in one scenario. That's if our peak, scenario, uh, peak temperature becomes four degrees, four degrees Celsius above pre-industrial levels, but we manage to come down back to 1.5 degrees within 200 years. That's a rather short overshoot period. We would still trigger three out of these four tipping points in this scenario. So that risk is really significant. So we need to talk about overshoot as a problem if we start recognizing climate tipping points in our governance discussion. And of course, then negative emissions and geoengineering play a greater role if we have fewer pathways towards our goal. Um, but prevention is not just mitigation. I wanna make sure we all understand that there are multiple causes for each of these tipping points. So we'll have to talk about managing multiple causes and not all causes can be managed at the global scale. So here are just a couple of examples. If we talk about the Amazon rainforest, of course, temperature change matters, but there's also deforestation and other reasons for forest uh, degradation that matter for when we might hit that tipping point. So uh, we have to think broader when we think about prevention of climate tipping points. Then there's a huge agenda to be talked about in terms of impact management. Even starting to think about what might be specific impacts of climate tipping points, each of them is really challenging. There's very little work that has been done so far, but clearly there needs to be a conversation about adaptation, uh, about new vulnerability assessments, who or what, where and when is vulnerable, uh, the nature of the risk we're, we're facing when it comes to climate tipping points, which is the loss or transformation of biomes, implies a certain permanence of the changes that we are talking about not just non-linearity, so rapid changes, but really permanence, which might mean a higher relevance for loss and damage, which is a hugely contested set of, of governance questions we are facing and have been trying to address for a long time. And then there might be a whole range of novel, not yet considered implications um, that we need to think through. So this is still a lot of open questions. And then I want to briefly talk about um, the importance of knowledge generation between science, policy, and society. So this is, for me, a very distinct arena of governance in this early phase of thinking about tipping point governance. Two questions. Of course, we need science policy interactions, knowledge to support decision making, right? So the science policy interface, but then there's also a set of issues that concerns knowledge to inform public debate. Uh, and then indirectly policy support by the public and behavior changes. So that's a science society relationship. And climate tipping points present uh, significant challenges for learning, meaning making and risk perceptions, similar to climate change in general, but I think some of the general issues are really elevated when it comes to climate tipping points. And one of them is of course, a lack of observability. We are now really able to observe general implications of climate change, Climate tipping points are processes we have never observed. They have not happened in the long history of, uh, of the planet. And it is given the scale they're happening at, it is very challenging to, ob ob to observe them in their entirety for a particular tipping process, right? So again, we're dealing with uncertainties. And as I mentioned earlier, we're dealing with long temporalities. Uh, both non-linearity and long time horizons makes for a really challenging context to make good decisions. And we're dealing with questions of uh, doom and fatalism, catastrophic risks, um, and that is hard. So Sorry, I can, I can I, it's very interesting, but we need, need to wrap up. Please, I'm sorry. I know. So I'll, I'll cut a few things short. Um, I wanted to highlight that we have some knowledge that points out that decision makers actually, at least until recently, had very limited understanding of what tipping points actually are. Some of my own work has done that. that just a few years, three, four years ago, two thirds of decision makers, uh, participants in international climate negotiations were not familiar with the definition of climate tipping points. And of course this kind of knowledge is key, fundamental for then forming appropriate risk perceptions and uh, making choices regarding tipping points. This might change. So we have now proposal, a proposal for an IPCC special report. And we've also had a first mention of tipping points and a cover decision of, uh, of a COP, COP27 but there's a lot more to be done. So uh, we can maybe talk more in the Q&A about what this means for risk perceptions. Some of my work is more on 
how do we help decision makers and governance actors in general deal with climate tipping points uh, that we might need much better tools at the science policy interface that help us imagine these future dimensions of these major changes so we can make better choices in the present. So I'm going to skip science and society, although this is important. I wanted to argue and make a strong case that we do need a social science research agenda on the governance of climate tipping points. There is so little work out there. So all the questions I've tried to address very quickly here, they need much more in-depth um, discussion and research. So that is something that needs to come. And then this one, I'm sure people want to know, but I'll stop here so that we can have those conversations maybe in the Q&A. So thank you very much and sorry for being a little long. No, nothing to apologize for. There's just so much. And I know lots of people are going to be disappointed. There was even a comment asking for the social tipping points. And I think maybe the point there for our organizers is that social tipping points, there are many tipping points. I mean, each tipping point has its own governance uh, implications. There is just so much um, that we just don't get to here. But thank you to both uh, Mariana and Dirk. Uh, very interesting, extremely comprehensive uh, 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 presentations, and mm -hmm. there are lots of uh, questions. Um, but I'm going to, I'm afraid, abuse my moderator just to get us going a bit, because I see a lot of the questions, there's some about the, just the ambition of what we're doing on climate change before we even get to tipping point is a, is a question. And then there's a lot of questions about the justice aspects, um, the global south, the decolonization, where the decolonization and just unpacking uh, 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 or, or dismembering the very strong Western uh, focus on things, if this is helpful, there are just quite a few questions on it. There's also about the point that there's more than one tipping point uh, in that sense. But I want to start with exactly actually where you were ending. I think, Manya, it might take us a good circle because I'm researching summary for policymakers from IPCC and um, the uh, uh, global, uh, the biodiversity equivalent, which has got a huge name and not a good uh, abbreviation. Now, uh, in a couple of weeks, they will be finalizing the synthesis uh, for the sixth uh, uh, assessment report for the IPCC. I haven't looked at the working group reports, but I suspect maybe you have. I know that in the global assessment report at, at, of IPES, there is no mention of tipping points. Now, if these are at a global level, um, because these are global issues and tipping points are global issues, if this is the starting point that our ambition, because our, the question that's got the most likes is about whether Germany's ambition is actually enough uh, for us to, to do things. There are questions about adaptation. But if it, on that knowledge science, science knowledge uh, uh, interface, tipping points is not yet firmly established, how are we going to get the... It, how are we going to get going, basically, because they, there's a lot of natural science view, and I personally agree with you entirely, there needs to be a lot more social science in that. But now we've got all of this, we've got your understandings, Dirk focused a lot on the challenges of the other geopolitical things, which which are headaches and amongst other things. But how how can we basically start the discussion with at least governments? And lots of non, both the civil society, fortunately, is not so dependent on government. They need to be more on the board. But private sector tends to take a lot of signals from, from government to get that discussion going, because we can't actually wait for these international things to enter and then start implementing. The, everything we've heard in all of these discussions is that we are heading quite quickly to a lot of tip, tipping points. Of course, the knowledge is you know, that has some uncertainty, but any observations from each other's presentation of how we can get going. And then I will focus on a few of the more concrete questions we've got. So sorry it, to have such a long question myself. You'd like me to start? Uh, yes, Manana, just start and Dirk, please uh, just take on from yeah. her when she's. So uh, this is basically the, the question of how do you even get this on the agenda, right? This is a political issue. Most scientists currently will probably place their uh, biggest bet on getting a special IPCC report because that's the, the way to, to move the topic, give it larger emphasis in the IPCC process so that ultimately it would gain more weight within that context and end up in the summary for policymakers as well, right? So you, you, you build that attention via the IPCC process uh, and that's where most people think we would, we would have to go. But that is a, 
a long road. The next IPCC assessment report is not for many years, so that's very slow. Um, and therefore, probably maybe not at the speed that we need it. Uh, this might be a job for um, national science organizations to start talking to their governments. As I said, it's also a, a task that goes beyond just reporting on science. Given the, the nature of this problem, um, the, the challenge of making it tangible and real and important in a way that we can make those choices right now, <laughs> It is so anticipatory, right? These, these abstract processes that we know about only from scientific reporting and understanding that this is something that's urgent now because it will have implications for many hundreds and thousands of years. That is, that is a hard thing to do. And we might need just novel ways of doing that, not just our standard science policy uh, processes and institutions that we have. But I should point out, of course, there is an ongoing effort to uh, create the State of Tipping Points report, the first State of Tipping Points report that the scientific community around University of Exeter is, is organizing, uh, trying to present for COP28. So that was a first effort to bring something to a policy venue that says this thing is important. But yeah, the multiple avenues we have to just find the interested, most interested agents, or at least help actors understand what their interests are with respect to, to tipping points so they can start talking about this. Dirk. So I, yeah. Yeah. I have three, three ideas related to what you asked us about. The first thing is that I think we need more interaction and more joint learning between the earth system community and the climate community and the biodiversity community. And just coming out of a week's uh, discussions between the two and I noticed that the perspectives on tipping points are different and I think we need a stronger even stronger consensus about the tipping point perspective and when, when I'm listening to biodiversity people from time to time they see more reversibility where we argue irreversibility they see more re reversibility they have different time scales in mind so uh, having this kind of interaction and interchange would be very important to get a a clear consensus on, on, on what kind of knowledge we stand. So this is number one. Number two is, I think we need normative discussions. Uh, Manana, I, I agree with more, more or less everything what you said. And I mean, if, you look, if I'm listening to your kind of analysis, no, I would say that we need three more normative achievements based on our enlightenment project, which is already 200 years old, no? and maybe even going beyond the SDG setting, which is still very classical from a modernization perspective. And these three elements, and it's, I'm deriving this uh, directly from your uh, perspectives, no? these three elements would be first, uh, we have to focus on earth system stability. So, so humans being responsible for earth system stability. And this for our community might sound very plausible. For the world out there, political decision makers, private sector people, this is so far away, no? earth system stability. But this is, Manana, what you talk about and what I'm also talking about in many of my presentations, earth system stability. Number two is that everything we do now for the next decades to come, which is a brief period of time, uh, will have impacts for all generations to come. This is your temporality issue. This is huge. I mean, this is a completely different perspective on his historical changes and shifts and responsibility of current generations for all generations to come. This is number two. No? And number three is global justice. Because if we try to start manage this, Solve, you mentioned this, this at the very beginning, without a much higher level of, of, of global, of the feeling that we are all as a human community being con being responsible for social cohesion on the global level. I mean, this is so far away from what we have. So these are my three normative elements, which I think we need to talk about. My third element is then everything what Manjana says makes the negative emission stuff even more important. I mean, we, we are running out of the budget. We are running out of time. Uh, when we talked a decade ago, we have been talking about negative emissions and residual emissions. No? So sectors where we do not have decarbonization options, land use, uh, agriculture, 
cement, uh, few, few sectors actually. But now we talk about negative emissions to, to manage overshoot no? with the perspective that already beyond or, or around 1.5 degrees, we might run into, you call this catastrophic scenarios. No? So negative emissions, the whole discussion is becoming even more important. And we are still at the very, very beginning of that. And there are many controversies within the climate community itself. When I'm talking to parliamentarians, huge controversies around that. No? So this is something which we need to focus on quickly. Thank you. Um, there are so many questions and each have their little nuance. I would also encourage you both to the extent that we have to do a bit of multitasking. There may be questions which you can answer directly, which are quite uh, 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 straightforward. I'm trying to pick out the essence of it. So just to focus a little bit more on the role and possibilities of real structural change, what I think in IPES they call transformative change. Um, I, I particularly, I think somebody, uh, uh, this the most recent input from, from Catherine actually raises a, a, a good comment about, um, about that it's a systems issue i mean climate change is a systems issue anyway because it's 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 both a driver of biodiversity loss it's so dependent uh, or interrelated with the economy mm -hmm. um, i mean it just what does it not uh, affect in one sense but what particular role can uh, for those of us in the in in the north the global north uh, europe uh, northern america to step out of and see beyond our own view of the world um how can we use that to perhaps leverage a greater is there something there that we can use to leverage a greater shift and greater justice because we seem to be hitting a bit of a wall there i don't know if that makes a lot of sense but um a comment on on how our our colleagues in the north in the south can can help us in the north to shift uh, in that sense, because there are a lot of things online, as you were saying, the negative emissions, et cetera, but, but we need real structural trans transformative change if we're actually going to, uh, to, to manage anything. So how can they help us? What, they, what, what is their role in, 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 in increasing uh, um, our action? Uh, Dirk, and then Manana. Sorry, I realize I need to give you also some signals. Yeah. Yeah two, three quick ideas. The first thing is that <clears throat> this is not no north and south, this is global. No? My first idea is global. I think we need to reflect again about the narrative which we are working with. Because for a while we worked with catastrophic scenarios to make the urgency issue cl clear. We are running into a huge crisis. No? Then we shifted towards more solution-oriented narratives because our feeling was that we are paralyzing people. <laughs> And we are talking again and again about catastrophes and no one will listen you know, because they, 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 are sh they are shifting away mentally. And uh, what do we need to talk about now? You know, because obviously, manana, we need to talk very clearly about these catas poss possibly catastrophic trends. You know? And then at the same time, we need to combine this with solutions or even more than solutions with attractive future narratives to mobilize people to support change because there is also a structure there are also limits of structural change and limits of motivation of people to support structural change so how can this kind of narrative look like and we are still not at the end of the story this is number one number two is solving something which is more structural you know, from my analysis of these global interdependency crises for me it's becoming clear that i mean we all know that currently from our GDP, we are investing less than 0.7% into ODA funds. This is International Development Corporation, less than 0.7. Many countries less than 0.3 or 4. No? And we are investing now towards, in OECD countries, towards 2% in security issues. No? Having in mind the challenges Manjana, you talked about the tipping point dimension and your diversity argument. This is very different from tipping point to different tipping point. We need different strategies. And having in mind the other multiple crises I mentioned in my list from the 20th, for me, it's becoming very clear that we should argue that 
to, to manage survival in the 21st century, to stabilize the Earth system and build social cohesion globally, we need something about, I'm saying any number now, no? we need something about 10 to 15% of our GDP into global interdependency challenges, not 2.5. No? So factor four, maybe factor five. We need to talk about how to finance all of these issues to get the social dimension solved you mentioned right. So maybe I could just build on a couple of those things. I think those are two key things, the, the narratives and the resources. And the, the narratives I wanna say though, are the, the logics, right? We're coming back to having to create or needing shared ideas of where we, where we need to go where we want to go. So at least the idea of needing an attractive future, but also a realistic future that is at least to some extent shared by people in the global South and, and the global North. And how do, how do you create those? I would again, go back to the idea that we need to be at least for some of the governance efforts for the tipping points, maybe tipping points specific, maybe those give us a new scale of thinking about jointness, and collective intentionality. What are all the affected countries uh, related to a particular tipping point? How do you bring them together? What is the narrative for the future that people share and want to create to support the urgency? And how do you then generate the resources towards that? Because those are massive tasks. Yeah, so ultimately we're coming back to needing shared identities and stories about the future. And that needs to be science-based. We can't separate the creation of the future narrative from what we know about where the world is heading right now. So in the, in the research, I always see the, well, I see a lot of work on desirable futures, visioning processes, it's great. They need to be science-based. There needs to be some tie to what we know about these systems, what is still feasible, and then what in that space, you know, what, where is the normatively desirable, jointly desirable vision where we want to go. So a lot of this work in the anticipatory governance space needs to be about imagining futures based on what we know is going on. Thank you. I want to focus, I think, a little bit more on the precise issues that people have brought up. Um, for example, there is, uh, uh, I mean, we need to achieve both a, um, a nature positive and a climate negative uh, 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 joint solution um, in that sense. Um, adaptation, you yourself, Dirk, mentioned loss and damage, which was the big thing dis um, discussed at the previous uh, 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 COP. Um, somebody's made an observation about climate engineering, um, uh, Soros uh, commenting on that. Um, are there... <laughs> You know, they're, they're just so many questions and they're quite, they're quite long and specific. But your idea uh, of the intentionality, Dirk, uh, 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 how can that be scaled up or scaled down? Because there is also, I think, a recognition. There's one thing what's happening globally at the UNFCCC, but that has its limits. It takes time talking about the IPCC and the time it takes for those reports but can it be scaled down to a to to the national local regional level a bit more effectively to get us going while we're waiting for international uh processes because we don't get away from them these are international issues um i don't know if that question makes any sense to you uh, 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 uh dirk maybe two quick reactions to that the first one is that <clears throat> conceptually when i'm thinking about what what is a sustainable economy, a green economy about? We should, we, we still need to understand, we, and we have, not, we have not come so far actually, that climate neutrality, circularity, and biodiversity ecosystem protection, these three angles no, need to be thought together, and we are not doing it. Currently, we are focusing 95% on decarbonization issues, uh, maybe we are running into many resource issues or so circularity issues and therefore ecosystem issues because many decarbonization technologies and infrastructures are resource intensive. So if we don't get this from the beginning, circular and biodiversity oriented, we run into nowhere. And this is 
very practically a huge issue because this is not being debated in many scientific circles and not being thought about in political debates about sustainable, sustainable economies. Now, this is number one. Then the collective intentionality issue and how to move forward. I mean, the first thing which is coming up to my mind is global communication networks and transnationalization of networks. And in this dimension, we have been making a lot of progress. I mean, multilateralism, state-driven, is in crises. We even have to, to I mean, we talk about wars again, no? <laughs> and poss possibly global wars. But we have transnational dynamics and global communication structures between cities, young people, cultural movements, us as scientists. This is a main driver of collective intentionality where we can invest in. No? They said, I think we have been making a lot of progress in this in the science and knowledge dimension. Manjana, you actually, in a sense, emphasized that also, you, know, you confirmed this. But in the normative dimension, we are still lagging behind. And in the practical dimension, so real investment, we are far away, the factor six world, you know, from what would be needed. So we can talk about very concrete things, actually. We need this normative dimensions and discussions which Manjana also mentioned at the end of her discourse. And we need to talk about what would be needed in terms of real investments and real infrastructures globally to manage this kind of challenges. No? So the collective intentionality framework looks very abstract, but it, it becomes very concrete if you dive into it. No? And you understand where we are making progress and where we are not. Manjana, do you have any, any comments on, on that? No, nothing to, to go much further on this one. So I'd, I'd rather we take a couple of additional questions. Okay, good. Um, uh, let's see, there are just now, I've been trying to, at a higher level, uh, uh, get some of these ideas, uh, ideas in. Um, and now I am... Uh, let me just see where I am, sorry. I think if we can, it, some of the first, um, well, no, I want to, Manian, I want to, to, to direct a, a, a question at you now. Um, I think noting the point that apparently we will be looking at bottom uh, up uh, at the next event, that's, that's helpful to know. Um, yeah, I don't really... We are also pretty much at closing time. I don't know if folks want to talk about social tipping. Yes, actually, I think that would be great. If you could say a few words on tipping, uh, on the social tipping points to, to close us off, and then I will try and go through all the questions and see if we can get one final for both of you to round us off. But yes, please, I think say a few words on, on social tipping points. That's actually an excellent point, Manjana. Do, do you mind if I share my screen once more, maybe to go... Um, Back to one of the slides that I that I had on that. Um, here, can you guys see this? And I don't have to switch these display settings again. Is this good? Um, so, of course, there's been, we've seen this huge interest in the idea of the social tipping point, kind of as a response to the concept of the climate tipping point. And I think there's this this uh, fundamental notion that we could use social tipping points to counter climate tipping. If the climate system can act non-linearly non non or rapidly, maybe the social system can too, right? So just here, is, is Tim Linton has, has probably uh, <laughs> outlined this really nicely. Just as tipping points are part of the greatest threat we face, the same logic may also provide the solution, right? If we can figure out how to create decarbonization in a non-linear fashion, maybe we're a step further. So how do we do that? So we're really trying to think about uh, tipping social systems, maybe towards decarbonization, or but maybe also in other ways, to speed up or accelerate um, our responses or to create more ambition. The term ambition actually has come up in a number of these questions. How do we do that? And so we're actually framing social tipping as an anticipatory governance instrument. Let's, you know, let's speed it up with this tool that, that we 
treat total tipping as. I'm I'm a little worried that we might be overestimating the potential to control or to make social tipping happen, also where social tipping can happen. Uh, but we can, if we, we believe that social systems can change rapidly, we can think about it as a tool to accelerate mitigation, as I just said, and as Tim Linton has probably tried to argue a number of times, if we figure out how to create nonlinear changes in energy uh, production systems or in certain behavioral systems, then we could, um, you know, just hit the, the gas pedal a little and, and move faster, and that seems to be needed. We can also think into, uh, about adaptation in that sense. Maybe there are adaptive behaviors that we could spread more rapidly. May that be regenerative agriculture or, or other things that we could do faster. But we do, and you see that some um, civil society organizations have taken on this whole notion of social tipping as their core idea, and they're trying to create social tipping, political efforts. But we also have to consider, of course, that the process or the context we find ourselves in there is a, a big risk, given these interdependent global challenges, pressures on people, that there might be negative social tipping points, right? that we're going to see rapid social changes uh, maybe some of them uncontrollable and certainly undesirable that come with be that biodiversity changes, be that climate changes and the impl implications those have. So I'm um, I'm really interested in seeing where that where that potential is and we need much more knowledge about this. I, I'd be careful and cautious to say let's just go straight ahead and, and use that tool. But I think what I've just outlined right now is probably how, how the literature has approached this idea of social tipping. So we don't have a direct link, right? Social tip, no particular social tipping process is directly tied to countering a climate tipping process. At least we don't have uh, any evidence for how this might work, but uh, the logic is there that we, we should be thinking about it that way. Oh, there's just so much there. There's just there's just so much. Um, Dirk, do you have any just closing remarks or, or anything, Manana, you want to add in the top? But we we five minutes over now, so unfortunately, alas, I do need to uh, wrap this up. Yeah, um, I had two quick points because then I also have to leave Solvay. Actually, mm. the first point is that we should not isolate our discussions about sustainability transformations from other shocks and other deep processes of change. No? I talked about my list with these global interdependency shocks. I talked about Russia. So Russia, having Russia in mind, the geopolitics of sustainability transformations is something which we need to understand. So we should not discuss our pathways within context-free frameworks. No? So this is number one. Number two is that, I mean, to, to add to the complexity with which we have been talking about, the incredible thing, and therefore we are in a very important phase of human civilization. No? There are so big dynamics coming together, which are intertwined, that we, we struggle with complexity. Mm. Uh, I'm mentioning four, no? and all happen happening now. I mean, the first thing is that you told Manjana, you, you said that you are a global governance researcher. I mean, the, glo the global governance debate is only 30 years old, actually. We are still, but we are still struggling with globalization dynamics and how to govern those. So organizing politics on a global scale and stabilize a global system, uh, a political one, huge challenge, no? a first element. Second element, in the same period of time, uh, the Anthropocene, stabilizing the earth system. I mean, we had the 27th uh, climate negotiation now. So in the same period in which we are struggling with global governance, we are overwhelmed by the challenges of the, of the Earth system instabilities. No? Third element, I mean, artificial intelligence, the future of humans, our identity, no? uh, new interactions between technical infrastructures and human infrastructures and social systems. And as a last element, at the end of the day, we need to reinvent us as human beings as a global civilization. If we don't move into this direction, we will not be able to manage the other elements, which I just mentioned. You know? So global change is more than only looking at, look at the Earth system. Global change is about this diversity of dynamics, and we should not isolate our discourses from this context. Thank you.
We are so over time now that unfortunately I need to close things. I just want to apologize that I wasn't able to or I just chose not to answer specific questions uh, because there were so many and I tried to uh, a cluster to a certain extent. So I apologize for that. I hope that everyone still feels they did get a certain uh, a feedback to what they were wondering. Thank you very much for your time, um, both to both our speakers and to everybody who has uh, uh, participated. Um, there has been, uh, in the chat, there've been links about the next meeting, because of course we continue, and I would encourage everybody to go back and look at previous sessions. Social tipping has, as we were reminded, been a, a topic before, but there is just so much because these are so complex um, and systemic issues. So we, uh, we just can't can't quite ever get plumb the depths of this so we do the best we can so thank you very much to both our speakers um, and to everybody who participated thank you so much and have a good day have a good evening to everybody thank you goodbye thanks bye-bye everyone thanks for being here bye -bye. Thanks. thank you